If I'd like to ask your permission to speak. Thank you. Welcome to our fifth plenary session on Africana education. I'm really lucky, I mean, this is so easy. I have uh, wonderful speakers I have to introduce. All of you know them. In fact, I really don't have to introduce them. I merely have to present them. Um, last night, we uh, unfortunately missed the presentation of Hunter Havlin Adams from Argonne National Laboratories. He arrived just as we had begun. However, since it's his uh, presentation is very much related to what we're doing, so I'm so pleased he's here with us this morning. His topic is Rediscovering Ma'at, Insights from a Neurophilosophical neuro Perspective. He has an extensive cre uh, credentials, of course. He's lectured nationally on the history and philosophy of science, African, African-American history, biomagnetism, biophysics, cognitive science, neuromelanin, and science education. He is a multicultural education and science education consultant for many school districts across the country, and they say we don't know science. <laughs> he currently has in preparation several books, Science from the Heart, The African Way of Inquiry and Technology, Volumes 1 and 2, Coming Forth by Light, Ancient Egyptian Sacred Text in Light of Contemporary Biomedical Knowledge in conjunction with Richard King. We need to take our scholarship to the classroom. This particular individual has begun to move that scholarship to the classroom. I present to you, oh God, I forgot your name, Dr. Adams. Thank you very much for that very warm introduction. Um, since uh, the session is on education, um, I hope that, as I say, whenever I speak, to speak before a group of people is a privilege, and I hope that I speak well. If I don't speak well, please tell me, and I will do my best to try to do better the next time. The topic of my presentation this morning is called Rediscovering Ma'at, Insights from a Neurophilosophical Perspective. Ma'at was the quintessential foundation of the life ways of the people of ancient Kemet. It was a personal and social, moral and ethical, political and spiritual, ecological and economic and cosmic principle that guided their lives. It has been suggested that the urgently needed rash, radical social transformation could occur by rediscovering and revitalizing my Dr. Milana Karinga, Dr. Jacob Carruthers have been leading the bandwagon in that regard. Making Ma'at once again an organizing principle for the African world community. Offered here will be some insights into some of the neuropsychological processes involved in value judgment and ethical acts and how different cultures profoundly um, influence those processes. Because what we, what we see, the, the element that's missing in all our social theories is a biological basis, a neurological basis. Every single social theory takes as granted, as for as given, our biology. But they don't look at how critical that is in terms of epistemology, in terms of axiology, in terms of ontology, the nature of a person. Right. What is personal being? Right. Every single social theory has missed that crucial link. But in Kemet, that was integrated in their social theories. And Ma'at was uh, their organizing principle. The 
The most pervasive transcultural issue facing humanity today, particularly the world African community, is the erosion, the disintegration, the radical anti-life transformation of our moral ecology. And we find that has a lot to do with education. One of our most brilliant religious political philosophers, Maria Stewart, some years ago, offered a compelling critique on this state of affairs and some timely advice as well on how to meet the challenge. Maria Stewart said, where is the woman who would blush at vulgarity? Did not the daughters of our land, Africa, possess a delicacy of manners combined with gentleness and dignity? Did not their pure minds hold vice in abhorrence and contempt? Did not they frown when their ears were polluted with vile accents? Would not their influence become powerful? And she said, where is the youth who has written upon his or hers manly brow a thirst for pure knowledge, whose ambitious mind soars above trifles and longs for the time when he or she can plead the cause of his people? Have the sons of Africa no souls? Shall the chains of ignorance forever confine them? It is of no use for us to boast that we sprang, sprung from this learned and enlightened nation, Africa. For this day, a thick mist of moral gloom hangs over millions of our race. Our condition has been low for hundreds of years and will continue to be so unless by pure piety and virtue we strive again to regain that which we lost. Oh, then, turn your attention to knowledge and improvement, for knowledge is power, and eloquently plead the cause of virtue and the pure principles of morality. Now, that's current. What's so compelling about that is that she, made, she was a contemporary of David Walker. She made that in 1831 in a series of speeches, and that is as current today as it was then. Maria Stewart offered prescriptions as well as a critical social critique on econom economics, feminism, morality, politics, and other social issues. She said, um, along with other people such as Harold Cruz, which in his book, Crisis of the Negro Intellectual, only when the American Negro creates an ethnic group social and cultural philosophy will he or she be able to deal effectively with this dilemma in real terms. Cruz was very pessimistic in his book. Malcolm X offered another commentary that I think is more optimistic when he said, we black people can come up with a new philosophy. We can come up with a philosophy that nobody has heard yet. We can invent a society, a social system, an economic system, a political system that is different from anything that exists or has ever existed. Cornell West, um, Department of African Studies at Princeton University in his book, Prophecy Deliverance, an Afro-American Revolutionary Christianity outlines how African critical thought must accomplish these goals. And I just want to share a few central points of his outline. The first thing is that we have to define who and what is a human being in the first place from an African perspective. So we have the question of self-identity. Then we also have to deal with the political struggle in order to get control over the institutions that regulate our people's lives and offer solutions. Then he outlines five tasks that can accomplish those goals. The first task, he says, which, which goes along with what Cruz has said and others, Bobby Wright, a whole host of people, is to put forward an overarching interpretive framework to solve our problems. Then we had, that framework has to speak to the relationship between Africans, American, and European elements of this entire social experience. Then he said the second task, we have to engage in a historical, genealogical critique of white supremacy. 
we, we have to understand what is the social dynamic that we live in today. And the third task is we have to provide a critique of the second task of white supremacy. And then he says that there's four major critiques. Somewhere uh, our people fall into one of these four lines, that the existentialists who laud the uniqueness of African American culture and personality, the assimilationists who just consider African uh, American cultural tradition to be pathological. Then you have the marginalists who posit that the African American cultural tradition is restrictive, constraining, and confining. And then you have the humanists who extol the distinctives of African American culture and personality. Then he offers as his fourth task, which I have problems with, is that African American religious thought is to present a dialogical encounter between African American Christian thought and progressive Marxist social analysis. I think, first off, he makes the assumption that African American Christian thought is the only African American religious thought there is. So he's given primacy to that. Um, so I would disagree with him on that. Then the last test, he says, is to provide for religious philosophy uh, to provide for a political prescription, you have to have a religious philosophy. Uh, but again, he fails to outline the need for a biosocial critique. And he even criticizes black theologians, is that they're always talking about we're going to ameliorate our problems, but they never talk about how they're going to do it and what it's going to amount to. And uh, he goes on to say that there is a lack of a clear-cut social theory which prevents the emergence of any substantive political program for social vision. He needs to read Diop. I think he can be enlightened on that because um, there is a overarching framework which uh, Dr. Jacob Carruthers has said there can be no African history, no social science without an African worldview. Milana Karinga has said, and he can say it much better himself, but I do want to repeat one statement, is that, that we dare to create, pose, and put in place an African paradigm both for our liberation and even higher levels of human life. Um, I feel, as Milana and Jake and others, that Ma'at can be that overarching interpretive framework, that social theory that brings into coherence a lot of our thoughts historically. And, but I argue, I go a step further. I argue that we need a revolutionary, revitalized Mahdian perspective and praxis. Specifically, we need a Mahdian perspective and praxis that is right for this historical epoch. Because you see, even in Kemet, Ma'at evolved. It was not the same in the old kingdom as it was in the new kingdom. Okay? It must be revolutionary in that it, it must be genuine, creative, and open to change and self-critical. It must provide a synoptic vision to engage more of us in the struggle for a normative future of peace and harmony, happiness and prosperity, compassion and integrity, virtuousness, fairness, and beauty. It must be revolutionary because we understand it is very risky business to summon up to recover powerful symbolism and ideas out of our distal past uncritically. Amen. The symbol users, that means everyone, particularly our artists, must have garnered as best as possible an authentic, holistic interpretation of those symbols and ideas. Two, be very self-conscious of their choices and applications. And three, be fully aware of how their social experience is both similar and dissimilar from that of ancient Kemet. Concerning the last point, I submit that Ma'at is not wholly other, quote, that is totally anterior to the African American social experience, that we would not be, as some of our assimilationists, neoconservative and regressive crit critics say that we're doing, appropriating an alien culture. I argue that a Maadian perspective and practice is already implicitly, deeply embedded within the moral ecology of the historical African-American experience, and that it was never lost. 
from the heart of many of our greatest minds, from David Walker to Fannie Lou Hamer, from Benjamin Banneker to Zora Neale Hurston, from Sojourner Truth to John Coltrane, James Weldon Johnson to Ida B. Wells, Malcolm X <clears throat> to Maria Stewart, to Martin Delaney, Harriet Tubman, Martin Luther King, Frederick Douglass, Du Bois, Elijah Muhammad, Paul Robeson, and a constellation of others, including many of you in this room, can hear reverberating echoes of the Sabiat, of Pahatotep, Hatotep, Minakare, the eloquent peasant, that when we look at their works from a modern perspective, we see Mott lives in their works. The problem is that its radiance is scattered, is unfocused, is incoherent, like light from the day star. We must gather these individual rays and pump them up make them continuously reflect back and forth on each other and on themselves, becoming coherent like laser light, a highly focused, powerful, single beam of light. I argue that it must be a revitalized Ma'at perspective and practice. While the essence of Ma'at was unchanging, its, its expression reflected the changing socio-political dynamic of different dynastic periods. Our societies today are extraordinarily more complex than during dynastic Kemet. The assault on our moral ecology demands innovations and clarifications on Ma'at. I argue, and this is my last point here, is that it must be secular and spiritual simultaneously. It must pave the middle way between the secular and spiritual dimensions of our life ways, harmonizing them again. It must provide common ground, and I think it can provide common ground, for a sincere and empathic social discourse among our church, mosque, and temple communities, helping each faith understand itself better helping them to evolve out of a divisive and offensive self-exclusivity and self-righteousness, which not only ultimately limits the spiritual growth of the individuals of those communities, but it helps to maintain American social and cultural hegemony. On another level, my I, I think has, if we institute it, can have uh, great consequences for world peace. Because Ma'at profound, profoundly <clears throat> respects the profound personal nature of spirituality. It honors that. It respects the integrity of all existing religions. What is a Ma'atian spiritual ecology? First, that a Mahdian perspective tells us that we are functional parts of a harmoniously unified natural order, which is only a manifestation of noon, or creative chaos, or the potentiality in everything, something that's latent. To put it another way, we must respect and safeguard the entire ecosystem. We cannot exploit it. We cannot rape nature continue to rape nature or give sanction to the raping of nature by being silent. Because see, when we're silent, we sanction the continuation of the rape of the planet, the only planet that we got. To put it another way, we must treat it as part of our family. That's what it was. The plants, the animals, they're our brothers and sisters. We share the same air that they share. We share the same rain that they share. So we have to see it as a family affair. To put it another way, we have to realize that exist on the border of existence is non-existence. At every moment, death awaits. And so we have to push back this order, or its fet, as it was called in Kim. Now, this is similar to the Taoist view. Now, if you study Confucianism, Taoism, you find that this is part of their tradition. But it was pre their, it was pre their tradition. It was 
expressed very clearly and concisely in the text on the walls. You can see this. You can read it. A Mahdian perspective tells us that it's all right to stand in awe and reverence before nature, but we must not delude ourselves. We must not self-enslave ourselves by worshiping elements of nature, including other humans, including human artifacts and human ideas. Now, this is similar, I'm sure most of you know, to our um, acquired religious heritage, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. That's similar to their views. A Mahdian perspective tells us that there are many dimensions of human experience available to be experienced if a person desires to walk through the flames. You have to desire to have other higher levels of experience, that there are many possibilities. And the journey through the netherworld, netherworld through Amduat, speaks to that. Now that view is similar to the Hinduism view. Because if you remember, if you look at Khufu's pyramid, the Great Pyramid, you see two shafts going out, pointing to two different sets of stars. The idea was that you had a choice of afterlives, that you could choose to be eternally reborn, or you could join the imperishable stars and never come back at all, or return back to noon, if you will. You had a choice. No other culture gave people a choice of afterlives. OK? So it goes beyond Hinduism. What happened is that we had an extension ex existential split between theories of afterlives between all the other religions. Some say reincarnate, some say join the body of Christ. But in Kemet, you had a choice. <clears throat> a modern perspective tells us of the need for philosophical humility. That is, that there is no finality to the human quest to understand itself, itself in relation to others and to the cosmos. We must be vigilant and deconstruct all transphysical speculations about the nature of existence and knowledge to recognize and sort out the ambivalences, contradictions, and inconsistencies in our thinking. Now, this is similar to the Buddhist view. Now, this is all part of my art. See, that's why I can make the claim that it is an overarching yes. cultural imperative. A Mayan perspective tells us to honor and respect one's cultural heritage, to attempt to live up to the highest ideals of our ancestral sages, and to nurture that same quest within our children, within each generation. Now, we know that's similar to traditional religions everywhere. Tell their children that they must respect their heritage. They have to know who they are. A modern pr perspective tells us that men and women have different social experiences and voices, which must complement each other for a fuller and richer expression of their spirituality. Now, that's what feminists have been saying. But the feminist movement is so fragmented, they don't have any coherency among themselves. But within the modern perspective, the feminist element was already present from the very beginning. When you look at the sky, when you see Newt, it is out of her womb everything comes into being from. When the Pharaoh sits on the throne, that is an acknowledgment of his mother, his primal mother, because that's what the throne represents. It represents motherhood. And lastly, a modern perspective tells us that we should celebrate life ritualized joy despite the inevitability of struggle, of sadness, of suffering, loss of dignity, health, loved ones, power, possessions, and so forth. That's what a modern perspective tells us that. And that's a, um, an element that you find in every religious teaching, that you must somehow overcome your suffering, your sadness, and so forth to become a full human being because the central principle of Ma'at is balance, is that things may be bad today, 
but they won't be the same tomorrow. And with the right effort, you can help them be better tomorrow. And lastly, as I said at the beginning, that it must be neurophilosophically grounded. And um, uh, Dr. Carl Spite and myself, a couple of weeks ago at ASCAC, really laid out, and James Small laid out, how the fragmentation since the Enlightenment period, so-called Enlightenment period in Europe, where they separated religion, science, and philosophy into three distinctly different um, scholarly traditions. So we have to get back to the future. And we find that there is a growing movement within the Western community to do that, to integrate them back into one whole again. As Kamau Anderson says, the West is going where Africans have already been. And so there's a movement away from reductionism and dualism to a heterarchical holism and so forth. And nowhere is this more apparent than in neuroscience, computer science, <clears throat> and philosophy. Because you see, we've all been victimized by Rene Descartes' delusionary dream. Oh, five minutes. <clears throat> OK. Um, We have to see that um, neuroscience speaks to our biological functionality. And so we, we have to consider that. I'm going to have to do a very quick running edit here. Um, so there's a lot. We have to realize that <clears throat> just as our brains um, has embedded within its structure a, a map of our bodies that we have embedded within, our, within ourselves a map of other people's experiences. And to a large degree, we are always thinking through others. Always. We can't have this. There's no isolated experience of a per individual person. That we're always thinking through parents, grandparents, ancestors, thinking through other cultures, thinking through other entities, some people who like to channel, think that thinking through other entities, thinking through other persons, including their ideas, either Maat or Machiavelli, if you will. And what this means is that when we're thinking through by means of the other, uh, we're heightening the awareness of our less conscious selves by exploring the intentionality and self-consciousness of another person, culture, or gender. We have to get the other straight. We have to acquire a systematic account of the intentional world constructed by the other, or know who the other be. We have to deconstruct and go beyond the other, becoming transparent to the other, negating its influence, and revealing the intentional world of the other. We have to finally witness in the context of engagement with the other. That is, we have to have an open-ended dialogue, a critical dialogue with um, that other um, person, entity, or idea, or what have you. <clears throat> what is the Mahdian conception of a person? First is the inherent sanctity of humans. Humans are born in beauty and truth in the image of God, not sin. There's a natural altruism and compassion and em empathic response to humans. And that's, that can, I can talk about that. That's backed up by a whole host of neurobiological evidence. The perfectibility of humans, that life provides opportunities, challenges for continuous progressive cognitive ethical, empathic, moral, social, and spiritual development, self-mastery and self-reliance, continuously actualizing the divine presence in deeper and deeper dimensions of one life, the teachability of humans, that human beings are, are capable of learning, that they can change their ways, um, that disorder and disease can be overcome by knowledge and wisdom that humans have, to a large degree, freedom of choice. That is, personal initiative is emphasized, 
because God allowed you to be born, but you have to make the effort. So there's not any idea that you're fated to this, that you can overcome your fate. The de-emphasis of the importance of divine grace, that's what, that's what I'm trying to say here. That there, you have to have, take personal moral responsibility for doing good or evil. That one focuses on the consequences of one's thoughts. Um, and then you can avoid doing uh, things that are anti mat Then finally, the, the quintessentiality of moral social practice is the individual person-family community relationship. It's context dependent and occasion bound. That you have a person and community moral praxis, a continuously self-organizing, self-sustaining, self-transforming moral community via the process of individual moral development. Because see what happens when individuals are in this process as a collective, then from that collective, a whole different emergent more powerful moral process occurs. But you have to have a collection of individuals. And you had an optimistic view of life. What is a Mahdian way of knowing? First, you have knowledge through the genotype. That is, the wisdom of our bodies. Our bodies are great teachers. And our children need to hear that their body can teach them things about themselves. And that that men's and women's bodies have different experiences and they need to value those experiences and not degrade or dominate those experiences. Knowledge by perception, revelation of the senses, knowledge through the whole biosphere and cosmos, the wisdom of nature. We have to study everything around us. Knowledge through the mores and myths of our culture, wisdom of tradition, because we need to listen to what our ancestral sages have said in the past, knowledge by imagination, that is revelation by intuition, because see your intuition works from all those other levels of experience and integrates them and comes up with something new. And I can spend hours talking about intuition. And lastly, knowledge by reflection, revelation by systematic involvement via all the above and with others, because you have to look at the fact that you get knowledge from other people and only when it lives inside of you does it become truly real. Otherwise, it's just surface. What are some of the aspects of Mahdian so-called logic? We find the notion of symmetry, synchronicity, and serendipity. And what do I mean by all of that is that you have to realize that action is very important and you may not know what your action might do, how that might send off in another trajectory something down the road which you couldn't have thought about. That's the whole idea of synchronicity or a resonant type of causation versus a purely linear causation. That there is a continuous or hidden self-organizing order which we're all a part. We may not see the order, but it's there. And we have a multi-level causality that you don't know what the first cause is. Because you'd have to go back to the very beginning. That was the first cause. And so we have a chain, an interactive chain of causes. And what is a Mahdian rationality? It's multi-dimensional. It's economic. OK. All right. Okay, I'll finish up here. <clears throat> so this is a Maadian overarching interpretive framework it is something that I claim that we need and can achieve. That's something that's already living inside of us. We just have to um, make it real again. <clears throat> um, if we look at uh, the notion <clears throat> of, now I know, I know all of you, many of you have read a lot of books on Ma'at, on Egyptian wisdom and so forth, and you probably know that the feather of Ma'at, the ostrich feather on her head, symbolizes lightness, airiness, 
um, and truth and things like that. And you know that she stands on a stone. And that stone speaks to the foundation, the rock solid foundation of my heart. But no one has, has said, at least I haven't read, why was my art as a principle conceptualized as, as a woman? Oh, you know. OK, Charles. <laughs> OK, well, let me see if what I say is correct. What is it about a woman's social experience that's so unique that they would have her to represent fairness, truth, justice, and things like that? What is it about? I'm sure maybe most of the women here probably have a very good idea. But we have to look at it from a um, perspective of human experience going back at least four million years here. We have to look at human experience in that term as Diop has said. And we find that one of the most significant things about a woman's social experience is the shared intimacy of the mother-child bond. That is extraordinarily important in the development of motherly virtues, which become natural virtues. Because that mother gives that child affection, care, cheerfulness, cooperation, humor, trust. The child feels secure. This speaks to the whole notion of a natural development of a moral practice, praxis. And see, what happens is that as a child grows older, you know, see, um, um, the Greeks have a term, in, and this would cause a split in the Christian church called kenosis. That is, that God became man, OK? Now, they split over that fact. How could God become man? See, the comedic version says that when you're born, you're already in the image of God in the beginning. But as you become more human, that becomes more complex. It becomes more difficult. To, be, to stay, to remain godly, because you have challenges that you have to deal with. And see, that's why we have to have a social praxis that is natural, that deals with the natural capacity, the natural intention of human beings. And the people in the Nile Valley recognize that and develop this overarching framework called Ma'at. And thank you very much. I could spend hours talking about this, but there's other people, and I respect them too. That's OK. I'm so sorry, Brother Adams. We could have let you continue. However, we have two other speakers. I'm sure everyone would like to hear also. Um, you really are a balanced scientist. Wow. Intellectual, spiritual, philosophical. And he has provided us with the holistic framework in order to look at learning and how we can begin to dialogue and criti critique that learning. Thank you very much. Our next speaker, of course, requires no introduction. I'm only going to present her to you. Dr. Barbara Sizemore, uh, who has served as my mentor. She helped us as a consultant for a curriculum guide we'll be developing from Afrocentric perspective in New Jersey. She has taken up the challenge that was presented to us last night by some of the speakers, which who spoke not only of the need to develop an Afrocentric curriculum in schools, but how do you begin to have an impact on the political processes to make sure those curricula are adopted and accepted in the school system? Um, I'm going to let you talk about the struggles you've had with that particular uh, phase of your life or experience. Dr. Sizemore is going to speak to us about the debate on African-centered curriculum. Dr. Sizemore. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, so Sister Sharshi is now 1055. I want to talk 
with you the, uh, about the debate over uh, the African Centered Curriculum. So uh, my brother Wade Nobles will talk to you about the African Centered Curriculum. I want to talk to you about the politics around this because generally in this struggle that we're having to educate our children in this country, uh, most of the struggles are in a political context. And it's this context that batters uh, most African Americans and sometimes we are unable to know what to do in this struggle because well, the knowledge or information is just not at our fingertips about this matter. Now, there are many changes recommended for reforming education, and this, this big reform of education, as you know, had a critical year in 1983 when Ronald Reagan was our president. And uh, in the script they prepared for him to, to act, he, he, um, <laughs> he, um, he settled on a program that was to advance the interests of middle-income white Americans. And these reform efforts that have been suggested to us for our pursuit are uh, options that will advance uh, the cause of middle income uh, whites and any blacks who've happened to jump on those bandwagons. Unfortunately, unfortunately, our people are sometimes uh, not informed enough to know which of these options are, are, uh, are to their, uh, not to their interest. Uh, so let's talk about some of them. Largely, uh, the, these uh, reforms are a result of the failure of schools to elevate and accelerate the achievement of American youth, but not African Americans. That's what Ronald Reagan had in mind. It was the European Americans he was concerned about who continued to rank about 17th or 18th in international performance competition, especially in math and science. Now, African American children are not getting good education either, of course, and their chronic low achievement is testimony to that fact. At first, in the fight against segregation, racism was never defined as the cause and segregation the symptom. That was the first problem. Now, Malefi Asante says a strategy is a long-term plan for achieving an objective, while tactics is the science of arranging and managing the details of human behavior. And the long-term plan for African-American advancement is to eliminate racism. That's the belief in the superiority of one race over another. And busing, magnet schools, and other reforms were merely tactics that were supposed to get us to this point. For African Americans in public education, the long-term strategy then is eliminating racism from the curriculum and the attendant achievement gap between white and black students. Asante warns us, however, that tactics which become the objective lead to self-deception. And so for many of us, you see, these desegregation tactics have become the end, and we've forgotten all about the elimination of racism, which still exists in the curriculum we teach every day. In this study, in their study of 200 high schools and 400 elementary schools for desegregation effects, Crane, uh, Mayhard, and Narrett in 1982 investigated two aspects of academic success, among others. And this uh, study has kind of like been buried uh, in the studies. Um, these are the two things that they looked at, achievement and self-esteem. And they found that students felt reasonably good about their academic abilities and that African-American students were as confident as European-Americans despite their generally lower test scores. In other words, the generally lower test scores really didn't affect the way that African-American students felt about themselves contrary to what some people are writing about, like in the rumors of superior, inferiority. But at any rate, two-thirds of both races said that they had the ability to complete college. Uh, students resist labeling themselves as poor students and they don't like being called at risk either. 35% of European Americans, 35% of European Americans and 21% of African Americans said that they were above average and only 5 and 9% respectively said they were below. This is a 1982 study and I really don't think that African American students have internally, the majority, and maybe some of them have because it's all never absolute, but I don't believe that the majority of African American students believe that the test scores are really an indication of their achievement or ability. The central finding of this study was that the racial climate of the desegregated school was central to the African Americans' feelings about the school, not themselves, yeah. Yeah. about the school. And for African American males, their feelings about the school were critical to their ability to do school work well. Yeah. Yeah. For European Americans, school race relations were secondary. For African Americans, they were not. The other important finding for the researchers was the negative relationship between high and racial contact and racial tensions. Racial tensions rose 
where interracial contact was highest. And that stands to reason, I mean, that's just a common sense thing. The more white people you got with black people, the more tension you're gonna have. The fewer white people, the less tension, that's just a fact. Significantly, they also found that African-American students in predominantly African-American high schools had higher academic self-esteem than others, which is what Jacqueline Fleming found out in her study of black college students. Even the European Americans in predominantly African American schools had higher self esteem. <laughs> and you see why this report got lost? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Researchers suspect that African American schools often make a special effort to provide a good school experience for their European Amer American student minorities, and that this explains the higher test scores of European Americans in predominantly African American schools. But the high Euro European American withdrawal from these schools makes it hazardous. So even though these white kids learn better in the black schools, they still leave because they're just racist. You see? Um, and that's something we, that's very real that we have to deal with. Desegregation is not going to cure racism. <laughs> you have to do something else. You have to do something else with these people besides mix up with them. In any of these schools, in any of these schools where achievement is high for African American students, the principal is the key factor and can cause a change in behavior before attitude change occurs. So you don't have to change people's attitudes to get them to teach African American children, right? You just change the structure. For one thing, if they'd get fired if they didn't do it, that'd be a help. <laughs> While the investigators argue that school behavior can be changed without challenging belief systems, another approach is to hire more African-American and liberal teachers to change teacher behavior. And I'm glad they had liberal in there, because we've got an increasingly larger number of conservative African-Americans who are enough to make you vomit. <laughs> Importantly, the investigators also found that human relations, workshops, courses, and materials useful in promoting behavioral change and also minority history were useful, but not as a course. Okay. They recommended the integration of minority history into the regular curriculum. This was 1982, folks, and these people who did the study were white. You see why I got lost? Michael J. Barrett in the November 1990 Atlantic Monthly makes the case for more schools to improve American student achievement. In a comparison with 12th grade, 12th grade students internationally, the United States ranked 12th among 15 nations with Hong Kong, Japan, Finland, England, Sweden, Israel, New Zealand, Flemish, Belgium, Ontario, Scotland, British Columbia, and Hungary ahead of the United States in advanced algebra functions, calculus, and geometry. Observers have noted that Americans place more emphasis on differences in innate ability, while others place more emphasis on effort. According to Barrett, if aptitude rather than effort is seen as the key to achievement, the result will be to undermine the work ethic, at least as it applies to education. What's more, Barrett notes that American parents are contented or satisfied with their students' education even though they are failing in comparison with youngsters internationally. Yeah. Strangely enough, African American parents rate the schools higher than white parents, and the schools treat us worse, all right? Now, Barrett believes that it is impossible for Americans to achieve at a high standard as long as we attend schools 180 days, which is low in comparison to 24 other nations, Japan, West Germany, South Korea, Israel, Nigeria, and Swaziland. Now, African-American parents are the ones in the Gallup poll of 1983 who said that they wanted the school year to be longer and the school day to be longer. It's the white parents who don't. The next reform that has been shoved down our throats and unfortunately championed by some of us is choice. Choice is now the lead idea for improving education, especially thanks to Polly. The idea is for the state to provide vouchers to parents in order to send their children to any school of choice. Milwaukee is now experimenting with this, this solution, which was championed by Polly Williams, their state representative. Vouchers of $2,500 each were offered to children to attend the schools of their choice. 
Also, a school has been designated for all African-American males, like they got some kind of problem that's untreatable except when they're together. Choice advocates believe in the infallibility of the free market. They think that competition will provide the incentives for improving the quality of education. In reality, what's going to happen is the development of premier schools where the children of the rich and affluent will go and pariah schools where the children of the poor will go. The latter will contain concentrations of minority students because the free market works according to supply and demand. And as a demand for schools with high SAT and CAT scores soar, and the demand for these schools increases, their tuition will rise completely out of the reach of poor parents who have no money to augment the voucher given by the state. Furthermore, schools will be more segregated than ever before as the premier schools evolve into predominantly European American domains. More important yet, there will be no initiatives to change this since these were the choices of the parents. Then there are the reforms of parental control. Parental control, that's just an interesting phenomenon. Uh, we don't seem to have learned anything from Ocean Hill, Bronzeville, IS-201 in New York, Anacostia, Adams Morgan, and the decentralization of the DC public schools in Washington, DC, and the Woodlawn Experimental Schools project in Chicago itself. We don't seem to have learned one cotton-picking thing. 500 or more parent councils have been established in Chicago by electing participants to serve on each of these councils to provide the leadership and policy making for each school. The parent councils hire and fire the principal who has no tenure, and that's about all they can do. Why? Because 85% of the school's budget is in personnel. They do not have control over that budget because you have to pay people to work. So it's only 15% of the budget they can do anything with. You know, that's the money you spend for paper and books and paper clips and stuff like that. Now, the only thing they can do is hire the principal and fire the principal because he or she has no tenure. Or they can take a teacher's position and make two janitor jobs out of it, or two janitor jobs and make a teacher out of it. You know what I'm saying? Rob Peter to pay Paul. That's the best they can do with that. Since there is not enough money to train these people for these parent councils, for any kind of policy making, what do you think is going to happen in a city like Chicago? They're going to use the only model that they know anything about, which is what? The patronage model of the Democratic Party. And that's exactly how these parents are going. Didn't it happen in New York? Didn't it happen in Anacostia? Didn't it happen in DC? I mean, what in the heck do you think is going to happen? If you don't train people to know any different, they're going to do what they do. If I ask you to do something and I don't teach you how to do it, what you're going to bring to that task is what you already know. And then you're going to say, let me see if I can make this sucker work. And if it doesn't work, then you keep trying to make what you know work until somebody comes along and says, look, fool, that ain't going to work. You got to do this. And then you say, uh-oh, why didn't I think of that? Peterson says that in the past, Decentralized, ward-based, patronage-focused, lay-controlled school boards were gradually replaced by centralized, citywide, professionally directed, reform-oriented boards because of the corruption which followed. Teachers have retained their tenure rights in the Chicago public schools. Therefore, they will continue to have lifetime rights to their jobs, even though the principal is expected to elevate achievement. Now, you tell me how you can make people under your supervision do something if you don't have the right to fire them when they don't. That's impossible. Let me give you an example. At the Jensen Academy, this is a Chicago school, K-8 school in Chicago, 99.7% of African Americans in this school, the improvement plan adopted last year calls for expanding the whole language approach to the upper grades, emphasizing critical thinking skills, and integrating African American history into all of the areas of the curriculum. Now, this is great, but there's one thing wrong with this plan. You cannot teach children in Chicago who speak black English with whole language. Now, they're going to do this whole language approach to the upper grades, all right? Two out of every three Africans in Chicago come from Mississippi. 
Have you ever heard a really severe Mississippi dialect? Take your hand off the cup of Bible and eat it rock. <laughs> How you gonna whole language somebody out of that? Look, if you want to teach somebody with the black dialect to speak standard English, you must teach them the sounds. They don't have them. They can't give them to you. They don't have them. Look, a black English dialect has double the number of short vowel sounds that you need to speak standard English. That's why so many of us say, ask me a question. I'll be there on January 1st, all right? Now, if you want to correct that, you have to teach the standard English sounds. Otherwise, be grateful for ask me a question. And don't worry the person. Right? Now, a whole language says that you do not teach phonics separate from the whole language approach. In other words, one principal told me, oh, they'll learn it through osmosis. Can you believe that? When's the last time you learned something through osmosis? Well, it just goes to show you what's going to happen in these schools. That's just one example. While concentrating on the integration of African American history, African American language is ignored. You see, you've got to do the whole thing. You've got to look at what did, what did, what did uh, uh, Carter G. Woodson tell us in Miseducation of the Negro? He says, the scientific study of the Negro himself, his life, his history, his culture, that's what has to happen if you're going to teach our children in these schools. And I don't care whether it's public, private, or parochial. It has to be done. Many critics warn us in the ivory tower about being carried away by the elegance and exquisiteness of ideas and experiments. But many of our parents in these schools don't know that the people in the universities don't know what the hell they're talking about. They believe that these people really honestly know how to teach their children. And I said, how can this person know how to teach your child when he or she hasn't the slightest idea about what African life history and culture is about? You can't even begin to analyze the problems that the children bring to you as a teacher if you don't understand who they are in the first place. Next comes collegiality. And this comes from Roland Barth of Harvard. And then there's teacher decision-making and power from Linda Darling Hammond of Rand, and a host of other ideas. And don't get me wrong, it's not just European Americans who are trying to sell these, but they've got their black counterparts, African-American counterparts, who are also coming across their doorstep with their bookcases and satchels in their hands selling this junk. Barth notes that collegiality is the presence of our specific behaviors. And in his book, Improving Schools from Within, he says, adults in schools talk about practice. Adults engage together and work on curriculum planning, designing, researching, and evaluating curriculum. And adults in schools teach each other what they know about teaching, learning, and leading. And he talks about these aspects in great detail in his book. But very little emphasis is placed on accountability or teacher administration evaluation. In fact, it is demeaned in Barth's book. Moreover, Barth bashes tests regarding them as unimportant to real education, even though Harvard relies heavily on SAT scores for admission. Now, in most schools, even athletes must score 700 on the SAT, as though the SAT has anything to do with playing football. So far, some educators to some, so far, some educators to ponder theoretically over their educational, so far, I'm sorry, so far, some educators to ponder theoretically over their educational worth is moot. And this is why I tell you that. I spent the first 30 years of my teaching life fighting tests. And when I finally got to be superintendent in what I thought was an all black city, I abolished tests and they abolished me. So <laughs> It's very clear to me that tests will remain here. Tests will remain here. So the best thing for us to do is to find out how you pass these suckers and do it, just like the Asian Americans do. And those are the schools that I study. I study schools where African American students exceed white students on tests, and these are public schools. Now, while teacher participation in decision making is important, most teachers do not want to be involved in all of the decisions necessary for running a high-achieving school. 
They want to be involved only in those decisions which will affect their classrooms, all right, and the teachers themselves. They don't want to order toilet paper, paper clips, get the roof fixed, and all that kind of stuff. They just want to be concerned with what impacts on teaching children, like what kind of books to use, how do you place children in groups for teachers to teach, and so forth and so on, what kind of staff development and things like that. So what we have to look at is what do teachers need to do in schools to teach children, all children. Actually, educators resist doing what has proven to be effective in accelerating the achievement of African-American students. Now, it's not just educators who do this, though. African-American parents are often their own worst enemies. I go into meetings a lot of times, all equipped with this information to fire at the school board and at the superintendent. And African-American parents will jump up and defend these suckers and say, oh, the parents ain't doing what they're supposed to do in their homes. And I want to say, oh, sit down and shut up. I don't have an idea. What is important? Maybe parents aren't doing what they're supposed to do at home, but that's got nothing to do with teaching somebody to read in a group of 22 in a classroom where you get paid $68,000 to do it. I'm saying to you. What we need to keep in mind is that whoever is in the class before the students is responsible for teaching something? Jesus Christ. Is it a giveaway program where all you got to do is go in there and sit down and keep people quiet and get your $65,000 every year? I mean, what's going on? What needs to be reconsidered here is accountability. Principals and teachers need to be accountable for something that goes on in the classroom. And let me suggest that it's teaching children how to read, write, and do arithmetic. What do we need to talk about then with these people in order to make racists teach our children in school? One thing we have to talk about, my friends, is what do they do in schools where African-American children who are poor come from single female-headed families, live in high crime areas, and still excel? What do they do in those schools? One thing they do is they make the proper assessment of what these children need to know. And you cannot do this, my friends, if you do not understand the cultural experiences that the children bring to the teaching learning situation. It will never happen. So. Multicultural education is another reform arena more closely related to my work. The idea here is to bring the curriculum into touch with the real world of cultural diversity which characterizes the United States and our public schools. It's an interesting domain. According to Sims' report in the Education Special Report of the New York Times, this reform effort is obstructed by a growing dispute among educators and scholars over two very different but equally legitimate approaches. One is called the separatist approach, which is an ethnocentric curriculum that emphasizes the perspective of one particular group in an effort not only to counterbalance the usual white male perspective, but also to raise the self-esteem and achievement of children from racial, and ethnic minority backgrounds. The other is the pluralist approach, which seeks to account even-handedly for the contributions of various racial and ethnic groups within the existing academic framework. Now, the problem with this is that this is the, not the correct way to frame this dispute. Because the problem is, the problem is, the problem is the existing academic framework. That is the problem. It is completely devoted to distorting the real facts about history, literature, art, music, drama, poetry, social science, and so forth. The next thing wrong about this argument is that it is not being given to the American public through the scholars themselves, but through ignorant journalists. Let me tell you about a couple of them. I mean, these people are just ignorant. There's no, no nice way to talk about it. Joan Beck, a columnist from the Chicago Tribune, wrote in the Pittsburgh Press the following. But many of those who tout self-esteem as the education answer of the 90s are letting it become a substitute for actual achievement. The, the I Am Somebody movement, updated for the 90s, is showing up in Afrocentric schools where the instruction is all themed around African and black culture rather than 
a Euro-Western curriculum that advocates say makes black youngsters feel inadequate. At their extremes, Afrocentric programs teach children that Africa is the source of many major scientific, mathematical, intellectual, and literary achievements, most of them stolen by whites who claim the credit. They stress the value of oral traditions and communication over repressive written language. One leader in the Afrocentric movement insists that whites are ice people lacking the melanin in their skin that gives blacks the, the sun people an intellectual and humanistic edge. The dangers in this approach are obvious. Black children, as all children, deserve to be taught the truth. They need the logical skills to help them understand and evaluate what they are taught, end of quotation. Isn't that special? <laughs> the question, the question which is the crux of the matter is this, just what is the truth? And that's what we need to ask. Whenever you sit in any kind of forum and listen to anybody talk this stuff, ask them, what is the truth? Give us your evidence, because they don't have any. They just have quotations from each other. <laughs> Beck, yeah. Beck takes her text from scholars committed to the Aryan model, or that paradigm of Western civilization. And these scholars called the ancient Egyptians white people in spite of the evidence to the contrary. With amazingly little and sometimes no evidence, their word through quotation is taken for, for, for truth. Now, the, the, the the professor she was talking about, of course, was, was Leonard Jeffries, the professor at City College of New York. And um, at no time, I've known, Lenny, I've known Lenny for a long, long time now, and I don't ever remember Lenny saying that we need uh, to um, uh, not be concerned about academic achievement. I, I've never heard him say that. Maybe somebody else has, but I've never, and I've been around Lenny a lot. Right? I've never heard him say that. Now, most of the, most of the uh, uh, people who say that are unwilling, however, to call Aristotle a racist. And even though Aristotle said similar things. For so see, Aristotle's a good guy, and Lenny is a bad guy, even though they said the same thing. Right? Because Martin Bernard says Aristotle said this. The races that live in cold regions and those of Europe are full of courage and passion, but somewhat lacking in skill and brain power. <laughs> Well, I was not taught that Aristotle's a racist. They forgot to do that. Now, this other ignorant journalist named John Leo, uh, on November the 12th, 1990, in U.S. News and World Report, he said, under the banner of multiculturalism, the rush is on to install an Africanized or Afrocentric curriculum in inner city schools. And he goes on and talks about the baseline essays in, in Oregon. He says, though many different plans are circulating, the most prominent of them is one that was developed for the Portland, Oregon schools in 1982. This outline, known as the African American Baseline Essays, has been used as a basic resource document by the city of Atlanta, and it is one of the models for programs that are currently being developed in Indianapolis, Prince George's County, Maryland, Washington, D.C. At the heart of the Baseline Essay, he says, is an unlikely claim, an unlikely claim, that consumes more than 35% of the curriculum's text. Ancient Egypt was a black nation. To gloss over black success, the baseline essays maintain Europeans invented the theory of white Egyptians who were merely browned by the sun. Experts do not seem to support this view. I phoned seven Egyptologists at random around the country, and all seven said it is completely untrue, then asked that their names not be used. <laughs> Education Week, November 28, 1990, reports that a number of Egyptologists disagree. They contend Egypt was a mixed race society. Moreover, they say the concept of race was irrelevant to Egyptians who freely mixed with other cultures and ethnic groups. These social scientists, however, belong to the Aryan paradigm generated to defend slavery. Now, look, all of a sudden now, all these years they've been saying the Egyptians were white. Now they're getting these challenges from African, African scientists and scholars. Now they must say, no, well, we, we made a mistake. They're raceless. Uh, they're raceless. Well, if they're raceless, then they can't be white. Right? If they can't be black, they can't be white. 
but they're not retracting that they can't be white statement. You see, they want to have their cake and eat it too. Now, perhaps the greatest challenge was mounted by the brilliant genius Chekanta Dia, who discovered a melanin test which proved that the mummies had black skins and then they wouldn't let him use it. His work is generally repressed in United States colleges and universities. The Chronicle of Higher Education, November 28, 1990, reports the need for a critical look at the field. In particular, they and others have faulted recent multicultural scholarship in this way. One, oversimplified rhetoric and literary theory has been substituted for an analysis of society. They must have been talking about Shelby Steele. <laughs> Two, a particularism has divided researchers into separate camps. Yes, the racist and the non-racist. And three, a political correctness which avoided self-criticism. Henry Louis Gates argues that minority critics are accepted by the academy, but in return, they must accept a role already scripted for them. Cornell West says that debates about the canon and academic curriculum have become substitutes for analysis of the problems of women and minority groups in the society. The issue is that multiculturalism further marginalizes minority groups. It appears that the power struggle is over definition. Who will determine what truth is? Who will then define the multiculturalism to reflect that truth? The winners will then determine what is the history. Europeans define others as they are discovered by them. And no group exists until it is found. The winners will then, I'm sorry, hence we plan to celebrate the 500th year of the Columbus discovery. John Leo and Joan Beck want to preserve this myth. They want to reject facts and cling to their myths. But like all good propagandists, they project their desire onto perceived enemies. Leo says the Afrocentric theory is a Tawana Brawley theory of history in which facts do not matter, only resentments and group solidarity. How does one describe then the history which we, in which we teach as illustrated by the Columbus distort distortion? Is this the Jesse Helm or David Duke theory of history? <laughs> what we need to think about is a national culture, one which is truly the United States or US. Neither Leo or his favorite professor, Miss Daisy Diane Ravage, want this. They want to claim that Eurocentric myths belong to all of us, even if they do lie. They want, they, one pluralist discussed her scheme for treating Thanksgiving with me. She taught third grade, and she said, I'm having a multicultural experiment. I'm going to let the Indians help the pilgrims to celebrate. So I said, big deal. I'm sure the Native Americans loved participating in the celebration of their subjugation and conquest. Amen. Now, in her article, Multiculturalism, Yes, Particularism, No, Diane Ravitch argues that the debate over multiculturalism is one between those who promote cultural pluralism and those who demand loyalty to a particular group. The particularist approach to American culture can be seen most vividly in ethnic studies programs whose goal is to raise the self-esteem of students by providing role models. And listen to what she says. Such courses are animated by a spirit of filial pietism and by fundamentalist notions of racial and ethnic purity. From my point of view, the argument is between several filial pietic groups, ravages included, each of whom is in a war over the control of the definition of multiculturalism and the curriculum to be certain that that group's interests are defended and advanced. That is exactly why the state of Illinois mandated by law that the Jewish Holocaust be taught for six weeks every year, not the African American Holocaust, not the Native American Holocaust, the Jewish Holocaust. What does Ravitch's esoteric categorization of political activities mean here? And why isn't she protesting that particularism? <laughs> Additionally, she says that the pluralist approach which she advances accords with traditional academic ethics in that students learn to approach their subject with a critical eye. Give Barbara Ann a break. <laughs> So what would she say when her students brought her Diop's analysis of ancient Egypt, a point of view which she would call particularist? 
She argues that particularists want their adherents to believe in the subject rather than to know it. What do we do then about the Jewish Holocaust? It's very clear that everybody's out for self. Each group is out for its own best interests, and we need to get about that business. Education Week reports that Arthur Schlesinger, a leading critic of the ethnocentric approach, notes that the accusatory is, is disturbing. It says, the malicious misrepresentation of African society and people was to support the enormous profitability of slavery upon which the entire American agricultural economy depended. Ravage, yes, I have time. Uh -huh. Ravage supports this. <laughs> Ravage, it's just now 11.30. Okay, okay. I'm going to be finished in, in a minute. I don't have much left. Uh, the debate is over. Excuse me. The great tragedy of segregation is that it prevented us from knowing who the other person was, all right? Now, the Portland essay attempted to do that. It was clear Ravitch did not want to hear that. That's not what you want to hear. You see, it's one thing to teach the Jewish Holocaust because the enemy was the brutal German, right? It's another thing to teach the African Holocaust or the Native American Holocaust because the enemy was the European American. And what they are trying to do is to forget it. Forget it. And if you start talking about it, you're bitter. Oh, you're so bitter. <laughs> These tireless debates leave me cold in an arena where the chances of life for African Americans become worse and worse. What we need is a national culture. Fred Fanon defines it this way. A national culture is the whole body of efforts made by a people in the sphere of thought to describe, justify, and praise the action through which that people has created itself and keeps itself in existence. A national culture in underdeveloped countries should therefore take place at the very heart of the struggle for freedom which these countries are carrying on. If culture is the sum total of artifacts which a group creates in its struggle for survival, self-autonomy, and progress, then the national culture must reflect groups in conflict. Um, a Native American versus the European, African American versus the European, Mexicans versus the European, et cetera, et cetera, because it was the Europeans who came over here and upset everybody. Now, Harold Cruz agrees with Fanon, but poses a special American problem. You remember what he said about that? He talked about everybody having an identity problem, including white folks. He said, the fact of the matter is that American whites as a whole are just as much in doubt about their nationality, their cultural identity, as our Negroes. And that's the problem of Negro cultural identity is an unsolved problem within the context of an American nation that is still in, in process of formation. Fanon goes on to say, the intellectual who is Arab and French or Nigerian and English, when he comes up against the need to take on two nationalities, chooses if he wants to remain true to himself, the negation of one of these or the other. But most often, since they cannot or will not make a choice, such intellectuals gather together all the historical determining factors which have conditioned them and take up a fundamentally universal standpoint. I'm a human being. Yeah. <laughs> now, we do not have a cultural democracy in the United States. We just don't have one. And in order to create one, as Cruz warned in 1967, we must have a complete democratization of the national cultural ethos. And each group, just as the Jews have done with their Holocaust, must frame its own history. Now, before African Americans, however, can enter, enter this struggle, we must produce our record of our history and our life and our culture because it has been suppressed and destroyed. So when people resent the fact that African American scholars are doing this work on ancient Egypt and all of that because they call it particularist, remember that someone has to do this work or we cannot enter that struggle. You can see why um, Dr. Sizemore is our queen mother and mentor. Thank you, Dr. Sizemore. Enough said. Our last speaker is Dr. Wade Nobles. He is with the Institute of the Advanced Study of Family Life and Education, which is located in Oakland. He just came in this morning to be with us.
from California. Well, you, they, you all know where Oakland is, yes? <laughs> He's the author of numerous publications, including a title of which I really love, Even the Mice Were White. He is currently involved with students working in schools, promoting and implementing an Afrocentric curriculum. He has served as a mentor for many African-American scholars and is currently empowering teachers and students. Dr. Nobles. I'm going to uh, try to be very quick, but I want to just, um, on some days I think that, that uh, our scholarship amounts to being a farmer and that, that the, the, the most we can do is plant some seeds here and there and based upon the, the struggle of the thunder and the, and, the, and the texture of the earth, something will grow in your minds and will make some great transformations. And so uh, I want to try to plant a couple of seeds uh, under the rubric of expanding the question because I think that the issue here uh, is being shifted and we need to be very careful that we have clarity on what the question is relative to uh, uh, educational practice in African-American children because um, it, it goes beyond the, the issue of, of the curriculum. Uh, in, in one of my publications a long time ago, I, I struggled with the issue of power, uh, primarily because for a long time in my generation, black folks talked about us being powerless, that we being a minority in this country, we couldn't do nothing, we just got to accept what the white man says, the white man's country, all of those foolishness. And, and, and I argued that power was not numbers, power was not even the gun, but power was the ability to define reality and to have other people respond to your definition as if it were their own. And the issue of power is the, is the central issue that is based in this so-called educational controversy. It is who has the authority to define the reality of educating African-American children and convince African folk that that's the right stuff to do. Uh, the, if you look at uh, this whole controversy that, that, that's been acted out in the popular press as opposed to the, the, you know, the, the halls of academia, that this whole controversy really when you analyze it centers around the nature of white people and nothing about the issue that we're struggling with. That the fact of the matter is that, and I just, I just say this because uh, in Atlanta recently, here in Atlanta recently, I, I, I gave an analogy uh, of Greek philosophy being vomit. And I suggested to the audience that, that black scholars need to stop being the vomit drinkers. That we run around just drinking up Aristotle, drinking up Plato, drinking up Aristophanes, drinking up all these philosophers, and then, then parading ourselves through our community. Thank you, sister creating ourselves through our community that we are learned and credentialed to the extent that we have drunk up philosophy from the Greeks. And I try to use the analogy that Greek philosophy, when you, when you look at it, was really a, an attempt to regurgitate what the Greeks had learned at the foot of ancient African uh, scholars. And that using the analogy of if one goes into a foreign land and, and eats their food and lives in their community, because our digestive system was not, not uh, tutored to the menu that is in that area, we would either have diarrhea or we would vomit because we're not accustomed to the richness of the menu. It's a natural biological function. And in the context of the Greeks going into Egypt, their pale biological system, and I choose my words carefully, <laughs> Their pale biological system was not adept at inculcating and utilizing the richness of the philosophical ideas that they met in ancient Egypt. And so they had diarrhea. They went back to Egypt, with, back to Greece with diarrhea and vomiting all over the place. Now, we run around as black scholars drinking this up, drinking this up. So I said that Greek philosophy is vomit. We should not be the vomit drinkers, but we should approach the vomit not in repulse, but as chemist, as chemet, as chemist. The chemist approaches the vomit as an opportunity to analyze and to look at 
what were the ingredients, what were the time-space relationships that allowed for the transformation of the original context of that information. And so rather than reject Greek philosophy, we simply have to analyze it in order to understand its original form because what we want to know is the original form and not the vomit. People ran all over the country talking about, I said this is Greek philosophy is vomit, didn't talk about the analogy of the scientific approach to the method. That led me to look at, well, what's going on here? Because I thought I, did, I was doing, you know, I'm, trying, I'm working at trying to be a good teacher. What, what was going on here? I gave a lesson. These people picked up only vomit. <laughs> then I realized that what's happening here, what's happening here is that, and I can, and I've, this, I've never taken a pride in having received a, a degree from, in psychology from Stanford University, but I want to use this for a purpose today. Stanford University psychology department trained me and certified me as a psychologist. Now, as a psychologist, when I analyze the reaction to the Afrocentric education movement, it is clear that it is a psychopathic, psychiatric response. It is not intellectual, it is not educational, it is not even about debate and reason and logic. The psychopath, as I have now been trained to understand, is one who has no remorse for the consequences of their actions, has no connection to other, never experiences guilt or remorse about their own behavior, and, and refuses to accept responsibility for their action. Now, when you analyze the reaction to, 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 to black scholars dealing with the question of educating black kids, when we get the, the commentary about uh, just changing up, you know, as, as was just mentioned that when, when, when Diop, uh, 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 demonstrated beyond doubt that the ancient African civilization was a black African civilization rather than say, hey, I was wrong. I'm remorseful. I'm, I'm guilty of making a mistake and I will grow from that effort. These folks just start talking about new lies. They just talk about they didn't have no race. They didn't believe in race. They didn't have the conception of race like we have. When you see the, re when you see the, the vengeful, the vengeful and vicious reaction to black folks dealing with a basic fundamental issue of educated next generation, it has nothing to do with intellect. It has to do with a psychiatric problem. And that psychiatric problem is what they're speaking from because in their own sense of normality is ingrained the fundamental need to dominate other because of their fundamental insecurity in this world. And as long as, as long as they have control of defining reality, power's ability to define reality, as long as they have control of defining reality, then they believe they have security in this planet. It is a psychiatric problem. We, we really need to be careful that we don't spend a lot of time debating with these folks about these issues because they need the couch, not dialogue. <laughs> they, need, they need therapy. I mean, they really they need therapy in terms of working this issue out. This is not an intellectual question here. And sometimes we get caught up and figure that we can just argue and debate and discuss and present the evidence that, uh, that the overwhelming burden of the, of the proof will convince people. You don't convince it. When you, when you see a psychopath who just chopped his children to death and has no remorse, ain't no debate there. You don't convince that person that they did wrong. You either eliminate them or lock their ass up. And, and, and that's, that's, that's the solution. And so we have to put the, so I want to put this discussion in that context because what has happened in this dialogue is that the, is that the, the other camp has attempted to make the discussion the discussion around curriculum, Afrocentric curriculum. And please understand that that is not the debate. The issue here is not just around curriculum. Curriculum, which I'll show in a moment, is one component of this enterprise. But there's, there are other components that we have to begin to address that uh, are just as critical because curriculum is just one of the ingredients, one of the tools. And, it, and, and I want to argue that it comes about in terms of uh, uh, a culturally consistent educational praxis. Now that is really the goal of American education, given that we are supposedly a heterogeneous society with, with various uh, cultural communities in the society. And when we talk about a culturally consistent educational praxis, then we have to talk about well, what part of that educational praxis speaks to the truth and the reality of African people. And that leads us right into 
the question of African-centered education. Because our culture is an African-centered culture, and therefore, for having a culturally consistent education practices, it must be Afrocentric or African-centric. Now, culturally consistent educational practices, and it's not a lot of words, it means something very specific to me, and I want to share that with you because I think we have to struggle with clarity. Right now, we're, we're, we, we are suffering from uh, the, the, the popularity of people just taking turns. So we got Afrocentric ice cream and Afrocentric shoelaces and Afrocentric everything because people just, people just take the stuff and just say, well, this sounds good, I'll use it. So we be real careful with the terminology and, and how we use it. It seems to me that a culturally consistent educational practice is a systematic process of developing and stimulating the knowledge, skill, ability, attitude, and character necessary for students if you put in the context of our own important question, necessary for black students, African students, to undertake socially defined, goal-oriented, and culturally meaningful activity that is designed specifically to allow them to do three things. And this is the crux of the, of the war. Education should allow the recipient, the participants, to achieve mastery of all aspects of human functioning. If someone defines our reality in a limited way, we never are able to expand the boundaries to, to, to achieve mastery of human functioning. Uh, we are now struggling with the silliness about good education so you can get a job. That's not mastery of all aspects of human functioning. We have people who have gotten the education, have gotten a job, and can't relate to each other and to their families. That's not mastery of all aspects of human functioning. The second thing that education practices must do is allow people to reproduce themselves in the objective world. Reproduce themselves in the objective world. It's no imagination. We're not imagining African people. Our task is not to say, if we can think about Africans in the future, they'll be there. That ain't true. Our task through our educational process is to reproduce ourselves in the objective world, not in some subjective realm where we think it might be there and maybe it isn't. It's with me, but it ain't with no one else, but rather in the objective world where whoever other is is confronted with the presence of African uh, beingness. And the third task of, this, uh, of uh, this design is to allow us to make explicit and validate our personality, our self, and our kind to make explicit what it is to be African. You see, we have had it sort of in home, behind, behind in, in, in back in the kitchen, that we know what it is to be black, but out in the real world, we take on all these facades and all these masks to pretend to, to get over. Because education has failed us in giving us the ability to make explicit, to make uh, validate our own personality, our own self, and our own kind. Culture is the critical ingredient here, and oftentimes we, we fail to struggle with what culture means, and we allow other people to define what our culture is. So, so African culture becomes the, the, the hodgepodge of the song and dance and the, the hero and the heroines of black folk. And then they want to struggle with us when we say, well, these are our heroes. They say, well, no, they can't be your heroes because we didn't find them. So they want to make sure they give us the definition of who our heroes are. So it becomes a complicated kind of, uh, kind of issue here. But culture is not, a pe it's not just a people's uh, song and dance. It's not just a people's history of heroes and heroines. Culture is more essential to a people's meaningness as human beings. Culture is the vast structure of behaviors, ideas, attitudes, values, habits, beliefs, customs, language, rituals, ceremonies, and practices that are peculiar, special to a particular group of people and which provides them with, and this is the important part for me, which provides them with a general design for living and patterns for interpreting reality. It is those patterns for interpreting reality that fundamentally dis uh, distinguishes African folk from European folk. We, see, we literally see the world differently, but we're forced to operate in the world based upon their vision of the world, and then we wonder why we ain't doing so good. We're not doing so good because we can't see what's going on, uh, because we're looking at the world from someone else's vision. Uh, we have to begin to, to recognize in that context that if culture is this vast structure of behaviors, and all those things are important, we have, we have to be about the business of documenting and clarifying and demonstrating what are the behaviors, the ideas. I mean, the whole discussion around, around Matian ethics 
is really a question of clarifying the ideas that are essential to African beingness. We have to clarify. That's part of our scholarship, part of our mandate as a human community to clarify those behaviors, ideas, attitudes, values, habits, beliefs, customs. You know, the 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 the, the rescuing and reclaiming of of traditional African rituals. Even though sometimes that gets that slips into foolishness because you know we get crazy sometimes and think that we can make all this stuff exotic and we run around with little occults here and there. That happens, but, but, the, but the goal here really is to rescue and reclaim those customs because those customs stand for psychological icons that represent the meaning, the essentialness of a people. So when you act out of a custom or you act within a custom, a ritual, a ceremony, you are really reinforcing and internalizing the meaning of your humanity. So we have to be careful. I think uh, uh, Hunter was really correct to talk about, you know, as artists begin to reclaim and play around with images and icons, that's dangerous stuff. Don't just do it because you like the color here. I mean, really begin to work with this and understanding it in terms of its, essential, its essentialness to the human uh, reality. If culture is the general design for living and patterns for interpreting reality, and if education is fundamentally or simplicity, simpli simplistically, education is the formal, an informal process wherein a people rationally guide and systematically guarantee the reproduction and refinement of themselves. All this stuff we talk about education is just fluff. When you boil it down to its fundamental essence, human beings created the human activity called education for the sole purpose of being able to guide and guarantee the reproduction and the refinement of the best of themselves. So every generation we move, we move to refine, to reproduce. The task is to reproduce and refine the best of itself. So we, put, we place that on the table, then there really is no debate. African people have an inalienable right, a divine mandate to reproduce themselves. Right. Education cannot, <laughs> education cannot educate African children if its goal is not the reproduction of the African being. And so, so the questions become clear once we begin to lay out definitions of what the task is. That the task is to formally and informally guarantee and guide the reproduction and the refinement of ourselves. Now I want to note that I said the reproduction and refinement of the best of ourselves. There is nothing in the logic of that statement that requires the reproduction to be the best. You could just reproduce. The task is reproduce whatever's there or reproduce the worst of itself. Why do we argue for, why in African education is, a, is the argument for the reproduction and the refinement of the best of itself? I want to suggest to you is because in that ancient archaic moment of African being, our ancestors laid down and, and, and adopted, invented and adopted a philosophy that spoke to the mandate of living. That philosophy in ancient Kemetic uh, 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 law is called the philosophy of human perfectibility. It argues that human beings come to the world. They come to the world and they be. And that's the divine law. You be. Think about it. I mean, it's so, it's so complex and simple at the same time that it's elegant. You come here and you be. No one can do anything else about that. You come and you be. That's the divine law. Because it don't be if you don't be. And so if you don't be, all the other stuff you think about or could think about or do or could do can't possibly ever occur. So our ancestors said that we come, that the, the principles here is that in coming to the world, in manifesting ourselves, the other, the other side of this is a whole discussion about uh, nothingness and thingness or no thingness and thingness or spirituality and materiality. And I can't go into that, but what I want to work with you on this, this moment is that the philosophical conceptualization argues that we, we, met, we are a manifestation of the spirituality or the nothingness or the noon in that we be. But once we be, we have a responsibility or a mandate to become. And so the issues are you be and you become. But the becoming is a process of becoming more better. And that has always been from 40,000 years ago to now, has been the inspiration that has driven African development. 
has been the essence of our educational systems when we just had one beat up, burnt out, dirty, nasty Bible and a candle and we taught black children to read. And now we get computers and electronics and we're talking about black folks can't learn because we've moved off the center. We've moved off the issue of you be, and because you be, you're going to be more better. And teachers approach the attitude saying, you're going to learn this. I don't care about your single parent mama. I don't care about your drunken uncle. I don't care about the fact that you ain't got no shoes. I don't care about all that shit. You're going to learn. Because the mandate was to be more better. You see, it is, it is this point, it is this, it is this position that we are failing to raise up as the essence of the educational mandate. Our essence is to teach the next generation to reproduce and refine the next generation to be more better. To be more better, that is our task, and because we allow other folks to frame and define the pedagogical debate, they relegate it to a question of curriculum and want to argue about what should go into the curriculum. And it ain't even about the curriculum. I mean, the curriculum serves our mandate, but it's not about the curriculum here. It really is about us recognizing that as a living species, as a living species, we have a response, an instinctual responsibility to teach the next generation what it is to be itself. The buzzard, the buzzard knows before he lets the baby chick buzzard out the, out the, uh, the, uh, the, the nest, the baby buzzard knows his buzzardness. <laughs> baby buzzard gets out the nest and knows I'm a buzzard. You know, the, the, the eagle, before it allows its, chick, its babies to be, be, be able to fly and to soar, knows that it is his nature to fly and soar because it is an eagle. The goat, the dog, the rat, every single living species, I would even argue the African violet, inscribes in the seed for, for the pollination of the next African violet what it is to be an African violet. We are the only folk, we are the only folk who leave that to someone else who leave that to someone else, who have been convinced through a process of indoctrination led by the psychopathic interests of another people to allow them to tell us that our beingness is good to the extent that it approximates them. And we get up, we try to get close to them. We try to walk like them, we try to talk like them, we try to act like them, we try to be like them. And then as was mentioned, when we fail to do that, we go into a no man's land called universalism that we are the individual. I saw a poor child just, just, just today, poor sister, talking this crazy stuff about individual, and at the same time, one side of her mouth, she was singing the supremacy of the individual, and another side of her mouth, she was screaming of the pain of having grown up in a segregated educational system. And I wanted to tell the sister, but I decided I was gonna be polite, that child, don't you understand, you weren't segregated because you were no individual. <laughs> they didn't segregate you because you're individual, they segregated you because of the fear and the hatred of what you reminded them of. And that's why you were victimized. But she now running around talking about we can't have, this is a great debate about whether Afrocentric education made sense. And the sister jammed it up about we can't have it because it, 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 it uh, diversifies and it, it, it's demeaning to the supremacy of the individual. I would have said you say, just shut up. <laughs> Sit down, be quiet. Uh, but you can't do that when you're, when you're in, these, in, these, in these certain kind of situations. I actually want to say, motherfucker, would you please be quiet? That's what I really want to say. You, do that. <laughs> you can't do that one, especially if it's on television. <laughs> and so I, just, I was just cool and tried to, you know, try to help a little bit. But, but the, 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 the analysis that I want, to, I want to struggle with you is that this philosophy of human perfectibility is an important one for us to hold up because it is documented as essential to our conceptualization of what it is to be human and that we need to then take that as the basis of all human activity, that the being is to be perfected and that everything that we do, whether it's working, whether it's driving a bus, whether it's relating to my old lady, whether it is raising my sons and my daughters, whether it's lecturing in a college university, everything is driven by the task of being more better. And that our ancestry understood that, that there were attributes of the living being that we could stimulate, both in terms of code, and that's what the, the Martian ethics became. It was a code that was stimulated to give us guidance and direction for the process of becoming more better. So you can't be less if you, as the ancients say, stand on truth. 
You can't be less if you live in righteousness. You can't be less if you believe in harmony. You can't be less if you believe in truth, justice, righteousness, harmony, balance, propriety, and order. If you live on those Martian ethics, you can't be less. You can only be ushered to become more better. And so we have to see our, our contribution because that's part of our, I know since you ain't come here talking to me, we don't know. <laughs> If my time is up, I might sit down. That's all preface. That's all preface. You know, I'm in trouble now. Well, let's see here. Um, okay. Huh? Uh, five minutes is rough. It's amazing. You know, so I maybe, I, maybe I should use this five minutes to point out that, that we're tr even in the exploration of these ideas, we're trapped in the European structure. That the structure of how we even talk about educating our own community is tied into something that makes it absolutely impossible for us to do this job other than you know five minutes here, five minutes there. That's why I, I said we were planting seeds, so I didn't realize that I ain't dug up the earth yet. This gave me <laughs> but let me try to go real quick because I want to I want to point out a couple of things uh, in terms of human philosophy, human perfectibility. That that ancient the ancient genius, ancient African genius recognized that all living things, all living things had three attributes that were essential. Desire, thought, and action. Those three attributes were essential. Desire, thought, and action. And we can talk about this in a sort of academic way that, that makes it sort of intellectual. But if you think about it on your own personal basis, and that's when stuff comes real to you, connected to your spirit, that when, 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 when brother right here is, is uh, out here in the streets of Atlanta and, and he sees a sister, he doesn't you know, go through all this old stuff about I wanted that she get her degree from Spelman because I got mine from Morehouse and my father's a doctor and her father may be a lawyer and, and we have certain uh, social economic attributes that are in common and therefore I can conclude in a normalized deductive way that maybe she would be a, a, an important mate or a, a companion for me. Blood, if he's honest, is checking out the sister's thighs, he's looking at her hips, he's looking at the, the physiology of the woman and it's all stimulated by desire. And even though folks want to believe that that's, that's wrong, that's not wrong. That's natural. That's natural. And then the brother moves to the next level from desire to thought. And he goes, tells his cut buddy, blood, uh, tell the sister that uh, I'm a uh, uh, work for the government. <laughs> blood, tell the sister that, uh, that uh, I'm, uh, I, I got lots of money. Uh, or, or, or he may peep and think because this is where brave she's, oh, she's one of them Nubian sisters. Tell the sister that I just come from Africa. <laughs> he do all kinds of stuff because he's thinking about moving to the next level. And then from thought, you move to action. That's where the three attributes are, desire, thought, and action. And in, in, in our community, we all know we have language that connote the action stage. Brothers say, hey, I see something here. I'm going to make my move. Hey, I see something here. I'm going to turn the corner on this sister. And all those things are tied to this notion of African, a notion of action. But the genius of our ancestry is that they recognize that those desire, thought, and action could become more better too. That they could be submitted to transformation. And that you don't stay at the point of desire, but you move to its higher level. You transform through the process of education. Through the process of development, you transform my instinct of desire to my instinct of pure love. So when I see sister, at first, it's just biological stuff. It's just the recognizing that she looks good, that she stimulates certain things that have to do with chemical imbalances shifting and moving in my beingness. But as I become more better, I recognize that sister is not that stimulus for sexual excitation, but sister is a reflection of myself. That's what pure love is. Pure love says I recognize in other exactly what I see in myself. That I recognize that I must protect and, roast and respect other just as I protect and respect self. So I've moved to pure, to pure love and not just to uh, desire. So the process of education leads us to that in terms of uh, uh, developing, reproducing, refining the next generation. Thought cannot just stay as thought. In fact, I, I believe that, uh, that uh, just as we would not have had an isolated discipline called religion or theology in the African tradition, we would not have had an isolated tradition called psychology in the African tradition at, at, at all. 
but because of these infusions and these, uh, these uh, uh, invasions, we have to develop those things. But the, the reason why Europeans invented psychology was because they recognized, uh, to their credit, that people could begin to think about things that were so aberrant and so unusual that the thoughts themselves captured the people and locked them up. And they needed a process to extricate themselves from the thought that there are insane ideas. So you can think any old thing. You can think anything if you stay at the level of just thinking. But the ancients said, no, you cannot. It's dangerous to allow people to stay at the level of just thinking. You have to move to the level of clear understanding. And clear understanding is couched in recognizing the intent of the moment as well as the consequence of the moment. And so, and so our answer said, you've got to do something with people because they come here thinking. You can imagine any old thing. I mean, you can imagine unbelievable things. In fact, we can see it now. We're we falling behind these people, and we got all kinds of aberrant sexual perversions, aberrant kinds of relationships because we are falling behind them thinking as they think. You see, and so the answer, that's dangerous. You've got to move to the higher level, to the level of clear understanding. And the clear understanding, that's right, put, that's exactly right, push back disorder. It is, it is that notion that, that our grandmamas used when they engaged in an elegant process of child development and child rearing, when they just looked at you and said, honey, don't do it. I know what you're thinking before you even think. <laughs> you know, and you all laugh because you know you heard your grandmama or your mama say something like that. Because they, in fact, moved from thought to clear understanding. They moved from understanding that in each, my, each of my children, there is a magic that reflects, it is a manifestation of my essence. And so I can plug into that and understand everything that they're doing. That's why grandmama would, auntie so-and-so would rub her elbow and say, I better call Hattie May back in Macon somewhere. And sure enough, when she called her sister she ain't talked to in 20 years, something extraordinary had happened. Now she had, her son got arrested for carrying what he thought was powdered sugar across the street because he was stupid. Or she had dreamt, dreamed about some fish and played some number and won some money. And a lot of she's on her way back to Africa. I mean, some, it could be good or bad. It don't have to be you know, either one. But something extraordinary has happened because she is operating from not just thinking, but clear understanding. Understanding the connection between beings, the, the, the physics of our beingness. Uh, Ansys also said that, said in, in, in these teachings, that action is this B state. And you have to move the, the state of action to its becoming, to its becoming more better. And that action has to be transformed to not just doing, because we come to the world. We literally come to this world out of our mother's sacred womb, doing, acting, acting, doing. But it's the process of education that informs us that in our acts, when we move to the higher level, we engage in acts that are acts of sacrifice or service to benefit the whole. That the issue here is not just to do, but in the doing, I benefit community. In the doing, I reinforce community. I reinforce with unity. So we have to understand that that is our philosophical foundation for education. That is a process of transformation is the task of education, of moving the being person to its rightful state of a becoming person and that we're continually becoming more better, more perfect. The, the, the issue of, then becomes, in terms of the question of multicultural education, our, our strand of the multicultural reform movement is Afrocentric. And no one can make the debate Afrocentric versus multicultural. That's a false debate. The issue is that, there's, that, that this society should have a multicultural education for all people and that in terms of our strand of that experience, it has to be Afrocentric. It has to be African-centric. And so multicultural education should be the conscious and rational developmental experience that is intentionally designed to reproduce and refine the best of a pluralistic society via the utilization of that society's varied and diverse cultural, social cultural communities that give them the identification and the transmission of skills, attitudes, values, and information that is essential. It's not just about getting information and, and ideas and attitudes. It is about identifying that information, those attitudes, that, those values that are essential and meaningful 
to our common human functioning. I say it, is only, it really is only the African voice that is saying out loud that the goal should be the explication of our common national culture, of our common humanity. Other folk want us to believe that they are being universalistic and we are being separatists and we're the only people that are arguing that I cannot approach the table of common humanity if I don't know what my menu is. I can't bring nothing to the table of common humanity if I don't know what it is. I can't do nothing but sister, sit down. <laughs> I can't, because I'm, 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 really, I'm really wrapping it up. Who's going to get us? Char, Char, no, no, Charcy told, look, let, let me tell you on something. Charcy is what he told me to come here for this when I had to rearrange my lifestyle to do that. So Charcy, give me two more minutes. That's, that's reciprocity. I left my glasses coming here so fast, I can't see what this says. This, am I supposed to read this? Oh, okay. I'm going to say, yeah, y'all just take over my stuff, give me a sandwich, and uh, let, me, let me finish this up. Uh, given, and I'll finish in, in two minutes, maybe even one. Given, given that, the, it seems to me that the question becomes, how do we structure the, and, and clarify the African-centered psychocultural foundations of education, which is what I was trying to, to lay out in a probably not an adequate, in an adequate way, and then move that analysis to the reinvention of an African-centered educational practice. That seems to be the goal of our scholarship. And there are strands that, that allow us to do this. The strands of recognizing that the foundation of education for the educational practices has to be our core philosophical principles. And that's what the Egypt, that's what the comedic studies are really about, is explicating and clarifying the core philosophical principles that are African. In that process, we are discovering that all these other folks stuff are really just versions and variations of ours. That's an incidental. That ain't the real issue here. That's an incidental, but they get upset because we're peeping the whole card and showing them that their stuff is just a modification of our stuff. But that was not our, our agenda. Our agenda is not to say we it and you all are just, you know, it minus one or something. Uh, that's not our, our agenda. Uh, then based upon those core philosophical principles, one that seems to me is that this notion of the, uh, the philosophy of human perfectibility, the Martian ethics become the, 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 the foundation. You move to talking about the cultural precepts that are the guidelines and foundation for educational practice. Precepts are laws. Precepts are laws, and every single cultural community has a set of laws that come out as principles or cultural precepts. The ones that I've seen most clearly in, 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 in African tradition are the notion of uh, unicity, of harmony, of transformation, of cooperation, of synergy, of collectivism, of oneness, the ontological principle of consubstantiation, which argues that we are of the same stuff, that we are all of the same stuff, or all those principles. From those principles, we move to the, to the clarification of what is educational process. An educational process is not the mixture of putting teachers in a room with kids. Educational process, because we haven't got to the yet. Educational process for us is understanding the complementarity between the knower, now as microcosm, because in actually our tradition, we as knower are the microcosm and the universe is the macrocosm. And that's what Hunter was meaning by no, your body can teach you stuff about not only yourself, but about the laws of the universe because it is microcosm, macrocosm. So it is the blending of the knower as cosmos, the knowing, the process of knowing as perfection, and the knowledge as mastery and service. So we combine those three issues, knower, knowing, and knowing, I'm sorry, knower, knowing, and knowledge, then we can begin to reconstruct the educational process that is designed for the African being. Knower being microcosm, knowing being the process of perfection, and knowledge being knowledge for mastery and service to one's community. From that point, then we get into the stuff that you all recognize as education, school climate issues, learning styles, parental involvement, instructional technology, curricula, administration, classroom management, financial resources, uh, board management, physical plant and school site uh, uh, conditions. All those things that we see as the structure of education are the strand that has to be built on our foundation. And so we're busy now talking about parental involvement and why black folk won't get into uh, be involved with the schools or should it be involved or how do we get them involved. If you, in, if you stimulate that involvement with parents understanding that we're about the business of making their child more better, 
they'd be there. So this was a different kind of equation they have to look at. And then finally, we get to issues of pedagogy, all stimulated, I hope you can visualize this, all stimulated by our own foundation. Pedagogy, the art of teaching, then becomes how do you orchestrate, stimulate, and encourage student behavior? How do you orchestrate, stimulate, and encourage appropriate teacher behavior is equally pedagogy, even though we never talk about that. We talk about the terms of behavior of children. And then how do we design curricula? How do we do educational research that are tied to that? The ultimate consequences of all of this is that every process ends in a product. Every natural process ends in a product, even though the product is an illusion because it never ends. But every process ends in a product. And if education is a process, then it must end in a product. And the product for us is not, and, and this is where people get, get upset, the product for us is not better scores on an IQ test. The product for us is not even better uh, raising GPAs. Those are all symptomatic of the real issue. The real issue is that the product that we're producing is a human being who is more better, who is more perfect, and the characteristics of that, that more better, more perfect person is one who is competent, meaning there's some skills, attitudes, values that they do well, one who is confident, meaning that they have an attitude to the world of mastery and service to others, and one who is conscious, Confident, competent, and conscious. Conscious meaning that if we are reproducing and refining the best of African community, then the conscious question is, who are you? Who am I? And if we end the educational process and our children cannot answer, and answer in an African form, the question is, who am I? Am I really who I am? And am I all I ought to be? Then we have failed. Who am I? You African. Am I really who I am? I am always under the atrocity of white supremacy and racism, so there's always this pull to make me something that I am not. And am I all I ought to be? The answer obviously is no, because you is the best that you are today, but tomorrow you got to be more better. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, I feel like the person with the hook. And you're right, it's only the seeds, all of you. Thank you very much. In the beginning was the word, and they have all brought us the word this morning. Special thanks to Dr. Adams, Dr. Sizemore, and Dr. Noble. Thank you again. The Queen Mother President is here, of course. <laughs> don't, forget, uh, don't forget to go over to the African market to continue your education. And Sharshi, you have some words? Yeah, I have to take Shelby's. Uh, the ASCAP people are having a luncheon, uh, and they were so kind. And, uh, and Zinka, is that true, Mr. Uh, just come here a minute, sister. Uh, this is my sister.